I'm about to discuss a lot of topics related to rape and sexual assault, more than we usually do when talking about Dana's storyline, so I feel like a warning may be necessary. If you find these topics difficult, it may be best that you do not proceed or do so only if you are 100% sure that you can handle it. Whatever the case, remember that what happened to you is not your fault, no matter the circumstances, no matter if you are drunk, no matter how old you were, no matter if it was someone close to you or a stranger, and most crucially, no matter if you loved that person or not. They dressed her in the wisps that Magister Ilario had sent up, and then the gown, a deep plum sing to bring out the violet in her eyes. The girl slid the gilded sandals onto her feet, while the old woman fixed the tiara in her hair, and slid golden bracelets, crusted with amethysts, around her wrists. Last of all came the collar, a heavy golden tore emblazoned with ancient Valerian glyphs. Now you look like a princess, the girl said breathlessly when they were done. Then a glance at her image in the silvered looking glass that Elio had so thoughtfully provided. A princess, she thought, but she remembered what the girl had said. How Khal Drogo was so rich, even his slaves wore golden collars. As we all know, in Dana's first chapters, the Cers plans to marry her to Drogo in exchange for 40,000 of his Dothraki warriors. The marriage is brokered by Ilario Mopatis, a rich merchant from Pentos. Because we have similar exchanges between houses of Westeros, where women are essentially bradmers, exchanged alongside other properties, many were mistakenly led to believe that this is just a shitty arranged marriage. However, from Dana's very first chapter, it's made very clear that this is a different situation entirely. Before we start, remember that if you like my content, like, subscribe and share so that more people can see it. Make sure to click the notification button so that you never miss a new video. Also, you can listen to this episode on Spotify if you prefer. Check the link in the description. Firstly, we must make a distinction between Westeros and Essos, since these continents are vastly different and it will, of course, influence how these things work. Specifically, the economic base of these two continents are different. Westeros is based off of medieval Europe, and thus, it is a feudal society. Nobility holds lands granted by the crown in exchange for military service, while the peasants are obliged to live on their lord's land and give him homage, labor and a share of the produce in exchange for military protection. Or, as it is more often the case, usually for nothing. Nonetheless, it is worth noting that contemporary scholars consider feudalism, or more specifically serfdom, to also be a form of slavery. Tyrion Lannister makes a similar observation in the books. The most insidious thing about bondage was how easy it was to grow accustomed to it. The life of most slaves was not at all that different from the life of a serving man at Castle Rock, it seemed to him. True, some slave owners and their overseers were brutal and cruel, but the same was true of some Westerosi lords and their stewards and bailiffs. Most of the Yunkai treated their chattels decently enough, so long as they did their jobs and caused no trouble. And this old man in his rusted collar, with his fierce loyalty to Lord Vabulchiks, his owner, was not at all atypical. After the outbreak of the War of the Five Kings, Harren Hall also becomes a site of forced labor. We use area to run messages, draw water, and fetch food, and sometimes to serve at the table in the barracks hall above the armory, where the men-at-arms took their meals. But most of her work was cleaning. The ground floor of the Wailing Tower was given over to storerooms and granaries, and two floors above housed parts of the garrison, but the upper stories had not been occupied for 80 years. Now Lord Tywin had commanded that they be made fit for habitation again. There were floors to be scrapped, grime to be washed off windows, broken chairs and rotted beds to be carried off. So, slavery isn't as far removed from Westeros as one would think at first glance. In essence, the position of many highborn ladies also resembles that of slavery. 
A feudal lady may not labor in the fields like the serfs, but nonetheless she is considered the property of her father and can be exchanged for something. Sometimes status and privilege, and sometimes more concrete things, like an army. That was the case with Lysa Tali, who was forced to marry John Arryn to strengthen the military alliance between the rebels. A feudal lady cannot freely participate in sexual activities, she must remain chaste for her husband, else she's considered spoiled goods. After marrying, highborn ladies are usually reduced to bradmers to bear children, who are also considered the husband's property. The age of marriage for Westerosi ladies is often very low. Lysa was only 15 when she married John Arryn, who was already in his 50s. So as you can see, the matter of who is and who isn't a slave is not always something that is literal and will probably depend on one's personal outlook. Someone more radically oriented like me would say that a lot of the things that are not outright called slavery by name are also slavery or similar to slavery, like the situation of many Westerosi ladies, Arya's situation in Harrenhal, or even some aspects of modern marriage, since a lot of studies show that, even in developed countries, women perform a lot of unpaid domestic labor. Is that slavery or not? To me, it certainly bears enough similarities to be considered as such. The matter of slavery is entirely unambiguous when it comes to Essos, though. Literal unambiguous slavery rests in the economic base of most of the continent of Essos. As one character says, slaves grow our food, clean our streets, teach our young, they guard our walls, row our galleys, fight our battles. Interestingly, like in Westeros, in some Essos cities, while slavery is formally forbidden, slaves still exist. There came a soft knock on her door. Come, Danny said, turning away from the window. Illyrio's servants entered, bowed, and set about their business. They were slaves, a gift from one of the magisters, many Dothraki friends. There was no slavery in the free city of Pentos. Nonetheless, they were slaves. This issue is explained in the world of ice and fire. For most of its history, slavery was widely practiced in Pentos, and Pentoshi ships played an active role in the slave trade. Several centuries ago, however, this practice brought the city into conflict with her northern neighbor. Bravos, the bastard daughter of Valeria, founded by a fleet of escaped slaves. In the peace accords, Pentos was forced to make certain concessions, most notably the abolition of slavery and a withdrawal from the slave trade. These provisions remain the law in Pentos to this day, though certain observers have noted that many Pentoshi ships evade the prohibition against the slave trade by running Lysine or Mirish banners up their masts when challenged. We list in the city itself there are tens of thousands of freebond servants, who seem to be slaves in all but name, for they are colored and branded, much like their counterparts in Lys, Myr and Tyrosh, and subject to similar savage disciplines. In law, these bond servants are free men and women, with the right to refuse service as they will, provided they are not in debt to their masters. Almost all of them are, however, since the value of their labor is oft less than the costs of the food, clothing and shelter provided them by those they serve so that their debt grows rather than diminishes over time. Slavery in Essos heavily resembles slavery of the ancient world, the one saw in Greece and Rome. In the ancient world, slavery developed for a number of reasons, including economic necessity, especially in civilizations and agricultural economies, where larger workforces were needed. Domination was another factor. War produced not only spoils such as gold, but also people to take as slaves, which eventually also became a form of status symbol. The more slaves you had, the wealthier and more influential you were. Much like feudalism in Westeros, slavery is a matter of class. Someone may be born a slave if their parents are slaves, and free people may be enslaved when they are conquered. Such a situation happened to Miss Sunday and her brothers when the slaver ships arrived at Nath. Her brothers were made unsullied, while Miss Sunday was made a scribe. When the nurse visits Astapor to see the Unsullied, she notices that the Astapori have no qualms to enslave other members of their ethnicity. Surely enough, marriages happen in Essos all the time, and on the same terms as in Westeros, only rather than armies, people may, for instance, exchange slaves. On that basis, we could argue that Dana's marriage to Drogo is simply yet another arranged marriage, and slavery does not play a role here. However, if that were the case, slavery and bondage would not be such a prominent theme in her story, particularly her A Game of Thrones arc. The quote I showed at the very beginning, about Daenerys wearing a golden collar, is not there just symbolically. 
the golden collar is there to link Daenerys' marriage to slavery. This becomes clear after Danny makes yet another peculiar observation. The palakin slowed and stopped. The curtains were drawn back, and a slave offered a hand to help Daenerys out. His collar, she noted, was ordinary bronze. Daenerys is established as someone who is quite perceptive, and it's not a coincidence that she makes a note of a slave wearing a bronze collar. If the golden collar meant anything else in this context, it would not be juxtaposed against a bronze collar of someone who is unambiguously a slave. This shows a crucial thing. Even in bondage, there exists a hierarchy. Many people have this incorrect vision of slavery that it's all just manual labor, but that is not necessarily the case. In ancient Rome, many skilled craftsmen were also slaves. Hairdressers, painters, and even teachers. Often, such slaves were treated better than slaves who performed manual labor. Sometimes even, there might have been forged bonds of love, romantic or familial. That did not change the fact that they were still slaves, and even the situation of beloved slaves is not as stable as it may seem at first glance. In A Dance with Dragons, when Tyrion is enslaved, we meet a character, Sweets, who belongs to Yezan Zokagas, and I believe that her situation encapsulates the nuances of slavery very well. They would share this space with Yezan's other treasures, a boy with twisted hairy goat legs, a two-headed girl out of Mantaris, a bearded woman, and a willowy creature called Sweets who dressed in moonstones and mirish lace. You are trying to decide if I'm a man or woman, Sweets said, when she was brought before the dwarves. Then she lifted her skirts and showed them what was underneath. I'm both and Master loves me best. Sweets is shown to be well cared for. She wears beautiful clothes and jewelry. She appears to be intelligent, well articulated and educated, speaking four languages. Her status is certainly much different from that of slaves who labor in the fields or perform other manual labor. Some slaves even resent Sweets because of how well she is being treated. Nonetheless, Sweets remains a sex slave, and the situation by the end of A Dance with Dragons shows that even a sex slave beloved by the master is not safe from the hazards of enslavement. When Yezan falls sick, Sweets is aware of what will happen if she is not protected by him. Sweets gave them both a desperate look. Yezan must not die. The hermaphrodite struck the brow of their gargantuan master, pushing back his sweat-damp hair. Some masters free their slaves when they die, said Penny. Sweets tittered. It was a ghastly sound. Only favorites. They free them from the woes of the world, to accompany their beloved master to the grave and serve him in the afterlife. Sweets should know. His will be the first road slit. The status of a slave can be taken away just as easily as it was given. Sweets is currently in a war camp accompanying her master and he falls ill from the pale mare. Without his protection, she is sure to, at the very least, be killed and probably even worse before that. But one does not have to be in the active war zone to lose the protection of a master. What happens to a slave who can no longer perform their assigned labor? What happens if an attractive bed slave grows old, gets disfigured, or the master simply loses interest in them? The widow of the waterfront, an enslaved Yunkish woman who was freed by her master who fell in love with her, is shown as an exceptional exception and not the rule. What happens to a slave teacher or a scholar? when he becomes too old, too senile, or too frail? What happens to a bridal slave or a slave concubine who fails to give birth to a son? What happens to a slave craftsman who loses his hand in an accident? What happens to a slave who loses his master's favor on a whim? You are probably already lucky if your master is an alright guy, but that still does not protect you from chance and his whims. The golden collar around your neck won't protect you from any of this. The hierarchy within slavery exists not just for convenience, but to prevent slaves from uniting. Slaves who are forced to perform grueling physical labor will resent bad slaves who are otherwise pampered and well cared for. At the end of the day, however, they are all slaves. It's similar to how other economic systems also create hierarchies that breed resentment. A blue-collar worker may resent a white-collar worker. A burger flipper may resent an affluent doctor. A poor peasant might resent a wealthy peasant. It's a strategy as old as humanity itself. Divide and conquer. Tyrio makes a comment that, strangely, Sweets is sad not only because of what will happen to her after Yezen dies, but also because she is genuinely fond of Yezen. Does this all not remind you of anything? <laughs> ¶¶
The golden color is not the only thing that points out that Daenerys' situation is different than just a regular arranged marriage. It's the fact that Drogo purchased Daenerys. The Sraki do not buy and sell in the traditional sense, but they do exchange gifts and it's an equivalent of a purchase. I feel the need to say this because some people said that Danny can't be a slave because there was no purchase being made in money. That would mean that the Thraki have no slaves, nor do they drive the institution on the continent, which is very obviously not the case. Danny notes that the two women who helped her to get ready were gifts from a Dothraki call. When the Dothraki bring some captured slaves to one of the free cities or to Slaver's Bay, they are given something in exchange, and in that way, they earn the things they want or need. The nine towered mans of Khal Drogo sat beside the waters of the bay, its high brick walls overgrown with pale ivy. It had been given to the Khal by the magisters of Pentos, Illyria told them. The free cities were always generous with the horse lords. It is not that we fear these barbarians, Illyria would explain with a smile. The Lord of Light would hold our city walls against a million Dothraki, or so the Red Priests promise. Yet why take chances, when their friendship comes so cheap? So, these women were likely enslaved by the Kal, brought to Pentos and given to Illyrio, and he gave the Kal something in return. Physically, nobody bought them, and by law, they are not slaves. Nonetheless, they are slaves. This situation is perfectly analogous to Danny's marriage to Drogo. In fact, Jorah himself remarks in Vias the Track. He will go as soon as he has his 10,000. My lord husband promised a golden crown. Sir Jorah granted. Yes, Khaleesi, but the Dothraki look on these things differently than we do in the West. I have told him as much, as Illyrio told him, but your brother does not listen. The horse lords are no traders. Viserys thinks he sold you, and now he wants his price. Yet Khal Drogo would say he had you as a gift. He will give Viserys a gift in return, yes, in his own time. You do not demand a gift, not of a Khal. You do not demand anything of a Khal. While there's been no literal purchase, there's been an exchange that is equivalent to one, just like the situation with the Dothraki friend and Illyrio. Unless, of course, Dani is such an unreliable narrator that she hallucinated Jorah saying it. During Dani's wedding feast, as she received dragon eggs from Illyrio, she notes that Illyrio could afford such extravagant gifts because he also got his fair share of goods when the deal was done. While one might argue that the purchase was not complete because Viserys hadn't received his army, and I've seen people argue that, believe me, Illyrio made profits from brokering this deal. Is this not profiting off of slavery that I hear about so much? If Danny can't be called a slave because there was no literal purchase, then nobody in Drogo's Kalasar could be called that, including the women claimed as slaves by the end of the book in the Lazarine village. But they are referred to as slaves and are slaves. So it's already established that the exchange that occurred between Viserys and Drogo was a matter of purchase in the Dothraki cultural context. And even if we insist that the purchase was not completed, then at the very least Illyrio profited, and Dany was treated as Drogo's property all throughout A Game of Thrones. Khal Drogo ignored her when they rode, even as he had ignored her during their wedding, and spent his evenings drinking with his warriors and blood riders, racing his prize horses, watching women dance and men die. Danny had no place in these parts of his life. She was left to sup alone, or with Ser Jorah and her brother, and afterwards to cry herself to sleep. With every night, sometime before the dawn, Drogo would come to her tent and wake her in the dark, to ride her as relentlessly as he rode his stallion. He always took her from behind, the Thraki fashion, for which Danny was grateful. That way her lord husband could not see the tears that wet her face, and she could use her pillow to muffle her cries of pain. When he was done, he would close his eyes and begin to snore softly, and Danny would lie beside him, her body bruised and sore, hurting too much for sleep. Day followed day, and night for all night, until Danny knew she could not endure a moment longer. She would kill herself, rather than go on, she decided one night. Of course, martial rape is not something that happens only to bridal slaves, but Drogo's treatment of Danny does show how exactly he views her, like a sex doll and an object to be used and then discarded, with no regard of how he could literally kill her with how violently he was raping her, either due to internal injuries or due to suicide. Drogo has no respect or love for her whatsoever, and he only begrudgingly starts giving her some of it when she, 
quote unquote seduces him using the pillow tricks Doria taught her. So essentially, this 14 year old child had to seduce her way out of her husband to stop assaulting her so brutally that she almost died. However, Dana's life in the Karasar improves in part due to her seduction of Drogo and in part due to her dragon dreams, which help her cope with the difficulties of life in the Karasar. Part of that involved her developing feelings for Drogo, which is not at all uncommon among victims of abuse. We refer to such feelings as a trauma bond. Now, unfortunately, TikTok made trauma bond into a buzzword that has nothing to do with what is the actual trauma bond. Trauma bond is not when you share a traumatic event with someone and bond over this, but rather precisely developing feelings of love and devotion to someone who has been abusing you. In colloquial speech, you would call it Stockholm Syndrome, although the term itself is controversial. Nonetheless, the feelings Daenerys develops for Drogo are not feelings of someone who organically fell in love with someone. Dani has been forced into this situation, and it was easier for her to convince herself that she loved Drogo. As Crystal Rapel says in her article for Heartline, this emotional attachment develops out of a repeated cycle of abuse, devaluation, and positive reinforcement. It's only natural to develop a bond with someone who treats you with kindness. Many abusive relationships begin with a shower of affection and assurances of love. These attempts to manipulate often succeed since you remember the early days of the relationship and believe they can be that person again. Trauma bonding can also happen between a child and an abusive caregiver or another adult, a hostage and kidnapper, the leader and members of a cult. Trauma bond is one of the reasons why abuse victims find it hard to leave their abusers. But for Daenerys, she literally, physically could not leave. She had nowhere else to go. She was stuck in between one abuser, Viserys, and another abuser, Drogo. With Drogo, he at the very least offered her something. The love, protection, a place to belong. Viserys had long stopped treating Daenerys as anything else but his punching bag. To Dany, this was some sort of an improvement from the life she led previously, where she was essentially homeless and at Viserys' mercy. It's also important to note that Dany, while highborn, has not led a life typical of a highborn lady or a princess. She was born after the Targaryen dynasty already fell. She was not raised in a castle, had no servants, no maesters or a septa. A highborn lady, while still a pseudo-slave, depending on the status of her house, holds some power on the basis of her heritage. I specifically highlight the status of the house here because power is not something abstract. Houses in Westeros have power not solely because they are named a noble house. Power is not abstract. The Lannisters are more powerful than their bannermen because they're more rich, have more resources, and more capabilities to raise an army. As such, when Cersei was married to Robert and experienced a lot of things that Danny did, such as martial rape, she was not entirely defenseless against him. Cersei was making threats to Robert when the safety of her children was involved. Why would he? Robert ignored him. He would have bet him if I'd allowed it. That brute you made me marry once hit the boy so hard he knocked out two of his baby teeth over some mischief with a cat. I told him I would kill him in his sleep if he ever did it again. And he never did. But sometimes he would say things. Can you ever imagine Danny talking back to Drogo like this? Like, if one of your blood riders touches the women I claimed, I will do something to you? Also, Cersei could not have been discarded like a used toy no matter what happened between her and Robert, because Robert had to be in Tywin's good graces if he wanted to have his support and avoid him rebelling. Does Daenerys have anyone in the world who would protect her like that, at that point of the story? She had no army and no dragons by that point. We return to Swedes and the status of bad slaves with golden collars, who may have it better than other slaves, but the position of Danny, Swedes and other bad slaves is and has always been very fragile, hinging on the whims of their masters. Then... Let us ask ourselves a poignant question. What happens if Drago no longer fancies Daenerys? What if she gives him a daughter instead of a son? What if he decides one day that she bored him and wants another 13-year-old to rape? What can Daenerys do in such a situation without armies or dragons? Drago's armies aren't hers, and if Drago decided to discard Dany after he has a son, Viserys, provided that he's still alive, wouldn't give a damn. How fragile is Dany's situation can be inferred from one of the many horrifying passages in A Game of Thrones. If the cult died at the hands of some enemy, they lived only long enough to avenge him, and then followed him joyfully into the grave. In some Kalasars, Jiqui said, the blood riders 
Sherdy calls wine, his tent, and even his wives. Don't ever his horses. A man's mount was his own. Daenerys was glad that Khal Drogo did not hold to those ancient ways. She should not have liked being shared. Daenerys is literally grateful to Drogo that he did not let his blood riders gang rape her. From this, we see that the position of a Khaleesi is not comparable to a Westerosi queen consort either, though Westerosi queen consorts after Rhaenyra are not known to be especially powerful either. We haven't seen enough of the tracky marriages in this story to make an educated guess as to how many Khaleesis are bridal slaves. Judging by these comments, it's not at all impossible for most or even all of them to be. When Kalasar meets Kalasar in the grass, those who get defeated are often enslaved and it's not difficult to imagine that the women may be forced to marry their captors. They do become Khaleesis, queen consorts in a way, but does that take away from their slavery? Is it not slavery to depend on the whims of your husband, who can allow his bodies to rape you? Dani has no power but what Drogo bestows to her on a whim, and that whim can be taken away any second and it hinges on Daenerys providing for Drogo what a bride would. Sex and heirs. Notice how Drogo only truly starts respecting and loving Daenerys after she seduces him and gets pregnant with his son. In the show, their relationship was shown as somewhat more loving, but in the books, it's very clear that he sees Danny as exactly that, a doll to provide him with a son. Make no mistake, in the books, Drogo decides to conquer Westeros, not because Danny asked, but because a Westerosi threatened the life of his son. And to Rhaegar, son of Drogo, the stallion who will mount the world. To him I also pledge a gift. To him I will give this iron chair, his mother's father Satin. I will give him seven kingdoms. I, Drogo Khal, will do this thing. He says, to Raego, son of Drogo, not Daenerys. While this is something Danny wanted him to do, he explicitly frames this as something he does for Raego, not for her. Further establishing that he merely sees her as a tool, an object to produce an heir for him. If she died and the baby survived, he literally wouldn't lift a finger. I have made this analogy before, but I think that the situation Dani found herself in does resemble the situation of women in the imperial harem in the Ottoman Empire. I am not an expert in Ottoman history, essentially all that I know of this comes from the internet and random clips of the Magnificent Century that I watched that might not be historically accurate anyway. If you are more familiar with the intricacies of it all, you are more than welcome to correct me in the comments. But I am certain that women in the imperial harem, not sure you follow them, but at least some, were slaves. Hurem was a slave taken into Yastr, and Mahidevran was a slave as well. In general, concubines of the Sultan, regardless of status, were slaves until they were freed by marrying, but those cases were exceedingly rare, including the aforementioned Hurem. These women were slaves, yet led what you would call privileged lives. They were well treated, pampered, serving Kant in their gorgeous outfits, and otherwise had a better position than slave servants. Funnily enough, the mothers of sultans, while holding the titles of empress and having a lot of sway at court, were also technically still slaves until they married the sultan. These women could boss other people around. These women often held power and undoubtedly led a better life than kitchen drafts. Still, how much power they actually had depended on how much the sultan liked them. And why is that? Because of the hierarchy, because of the golden and bronze colors, because in all systems of oppression there exists a hierarchy, which prevents the slaves from uniting and breeds resentment, but no slave is ever truly free of what it means to be a slave. We find out about this when we reach the most controversial part of Daenerys' A Game of Thrones storyline. By that point, I believe that I made my case as convincing as I could that Daenerys wasn't a powerful Khaleesi because a powerful Khaleesi is an oxymoron. Someone who is worth less than a Dothraki horse is not powerful, and all the limited authority that Daenerys might have had under Drogo was his whim that he could take away at any second for any reason. The reason why Drogo and Daenerys are even married is because he purchased her in the Dothraki cultural context, a gift wrapped in a golden collar. As such, Daenerys Targaryen herself could not own slaves. She could have servants, but ultimately, Doria, Iri, Jiqui, and the Lazarine women were slaves to Drogo, but servants to Daenerys, golden and bronze scholars. Surely, Daenerys does hold power and privilege over them, and surely they were slaves, just not her slaves. She wasn't the one to decide to go and sack the Lazarine village. 
She wanted Drogo to go to Westeros, sure, but she was not prepared to see what war actually entails, since she is an 8th grader. Daenerys could have easily shrugged it off and accepted the premise that this is war, this is what it looks like, but instead she decides, no, this is not how it is going to be. I will not allow any more rape. And rather than to see it as a positive action she takes with that limited power that was given to her, she is called a slaver and a slave owner on the premise that she is Drogo's powerful wife that was just married off to him rather than physically sold. In which case I ask, what else should she do in this situation? Because the only possible alternative for her would be to do nothing. She is in no position to free anyone because she isn't free herself. As George R. R. Martin reiterates in the Blu-ray commentary for season one. So Danny can't enact the idea of don't take slaves. Even preventing the riders from the rapes comes with a huge risk. This one is Mago, who rides in the cast of Kojako. He says the Khaleesi has taken his poles, a daughter of the lambs who was his to mount. Khal Drogo's face was still and hard, but his black eyes were curious as they went to Danny. Tell me the truth of this, one of my life, he commanded in the tracking. Danny told him what she had done, in his own tongue, so the Khal would understand her better, her words simple and direct. When she was done, Drogo was frowning. This is the way of war. These women are our slaves now, to do with as we please. It pleases me to hold them safe, Danny said, wondering if she had dared too much. If your warriors would mourn these women, let them take them gently and keep them for wives. Keep them places in the Kalasar and let them bear you sons. This is an extremely complex situation and even a free adult would have a problem navigating it, let alone 14 year old pregnant bridal slave. The nurse suggests that these women marry their captors for three reasons. One, to soften the blow of her daring to take such an action. Two, because she herself was married off against her will and trauma bonded with her abuser, meaning that she may as well believe that these women will do the same. Three, because someone's wife would generally be safer than just a random girl in the Kalasar, who could be claimed by just about anyone. The reason why Daenerys claims these women is not only because she wants to protect them as they are en route to Slaver's Bay, but because she intends to keep these women around indefinitely. Else she would not make the suggestion to incorporate them into the Kalasar, would she? And besides, even if Dani was able to free these women, where should they go? Their village and entire way of life was destroyed. This is the best Dani could do in the situation she found herself in. She already took a huge risk and we see how badly that went for her later on. After Drogo dies, not only her safety is compromised, but also the safety of the women she claimed. And when she no longer has the protection and power bestowed by Drogo, at least one of the women she claimed, Iroe, gets raped and killed. I feel like many people, not only in the fandom but overall, have this approach to morality that it's better to do nothing wrong than it is to do something right. Scrutinizing this situation to make Danny seem like she's in the wrong is emblematic of that very mindset. Because she could not immediately solve the situation at large, it would probably be better in people's eyes if she did nothing. But that she did something reflects positively on her and shows that, from the very beginning, Daenerys used her power, the very limited power as a slave bride, to do good. Daenerys Kalasar no longer practices slavery. Daenerys makes steps to end slavery in all of Essos, meaning that after she gains enough power, there will be no more heroes, no more sacked villages, no more slaughter, and no more gift exchanges. Daenerys' actions in A Game of Thrones are a microcosm of her character, her values, and what she is about to do. Her lessons were duly learned. Which is why I have a bone to pick with one Miri Mazdur. Obviously, Miri Mazdur comes from an understandable place. Drogo ruined her life and the life of her entire community. Her revenge on him is not at all unreasonable. But one thing Miri failed to account for is that Daenerys did not do anything to her. She tried to protect her however she could. You could argue that Miri does not owe Dani her gratitude, and I would not even disagree with you. But Miri was in such a state that she no longer cared what happens to her, and by extension of what happens to other women. By harming Daenerys, she compromised the safety of all other women Dani claimed, including Hiroa. She took out her anger on a child bride and an innocent baby. You might argue that she was justified in enacting a revenge on Daenerys and Drogo, but Rhaegar was just a fetus. He was no stallion who mounted the world. Nobody could have predicted what kind of a person he would have become. He did not hurt anyone, or kill anyone, or rape anyone, or conquer anyone. If he had to pay for the sins of his parents, 
Should this fate not await everyone? Were Blood and Cheese justified in killing Jay Harris because of who his father was? Daenerys did what any mother would in this situation. Caitlyn would kill Miri, Cersei would kill Miri, my mother would kill Miri, your mother would kill Miri, because harming one's children on such a whimsy pretense or as a revenge is fucked up and every remotely decent mother would not let it slide. A grown adult woman would probably have trouble seeing Miri's perspective, let alone a 14-year-old who just lost everything. Still, Daenerys did not kill or punish her slave for rebelling. Daenerys killed her servant who, knowingly, severely violated her bodily autonomy and killed her baby for the crimes it hadn't committed. Notice that the brunt of the punishment fell on Daenerys anyway. Drogo died and that's about it, while Daenerys lost her only protector and her baby, with the addition of not managing to protect the women. She still grieves for Eroa in A Dance with Dragons. Hierarchies between slaves create resentment. Miri, a very low-ranking slave, took out her anger on a high-ranking slave bride and her baby, causing immeasurable harm not only to her, but to other women, while Drogo was all but allowed to die peacefully, not paying a penny for the crimes he committed. Daenerys' A Game of Thrones storyline explores, among other things, the hierarchies of slavery and the resentments bred from these hierarchies. The matter of Daenerys being a bridal slave is not up to interpretation. The golden collar is neither accidental, nor does it symbolize anything but her slavery. Most crucially though, even the finest collar money could buy will never protect anyone in the long run. Daenerys takes this lesson to heart, and that's why she comes to the conclusion that golden collars will not do. Slavery has to end with fire and blood. Thanks for watching. Remember that if you like my content, like, subscribe and share so that more people can see it. Make sure to click the notification button so that you never miss a new video. And remember, Phoenix rises from the ashes. And ashes always land on top. <laughs>